Hello and welcome, I'm Bill and this is Intro to C. In today's video I'm going to have a brief history of the C programming language. But first I'm going to go back and to the 1800s and the reason why is back then we didn't have computers. And actually we did have computers, that was a person, that was a person's job. They computed mathematics. They All they did was they, they did taxes and um, statistics and many other things. That's all that their job was to do. Now, the first person to have the idea to mechanise the process was Charles Babbage. Um, well, in the Western culture, I should say. Um, is He literally made a cogs and gears and such like that, and he put them together, and he made a mechanical machine that did maths and such. So these this didn't do simple maths like adding and such, so you could have used an abacus or something like that. No, this did very complicated maths. It actually did... Um, kind of differentiation and stuff. So he had a differential engine is what he called it. So it did calculus in a sense. So it was very complicated in a sense. It did some complicated stuff. Very clever as well. But after that the people in the they kept they kept doing it and he wanted to create more and more elaborate machines he did. But he wanted to make his analytical machine which could have been programmed to do anything. Literally could be general purpose. However he didn't have enough money to finish it and he died before he could have finished it at the time. Um, if he lived a little bit longer, he could have used something like Meccano at the time when it could have been made, because then it would have been a cheap way of manufacturing it. But that didn't exist yet, and he had had to get all of his parts made, and it was just too expensive. Oh, well. So if we now go to the 20th century, um, so the, the 1900s, they were kind of they were making more of these computers. They were making them electrical and making them automated. Then they started making them with in a, with electricity rather than these cogs and gears, and they were making all this, and they were just solving more mathematical problems. And when they came to the uh, like World War Two, they wanted to in well, especially in England, they wanted to create machines um, to solve some of the the codes that the Nazis were giving out, like the Enigma machine and a lot of other things like that, a lot of the other codes. So there was Alan Turing, and he was trying to. Make trying to figure out a way to solve all these codes, and he thought, okay, why don't we just make a machine to do it? And literally, they made a machine. So they programmed, made up a machine that would solve these codes because they could have, if you did it by hand, it would have taken you too long, and the code would have changed by then. So they needed something a way of doing it quicker. So these machines had to be done, solve it in less than twenty four hours, and they did. They managed to be able to do it, and apparently they shortened the ward by numerous years because of that because they cracked these codes. Um, very interesting here, so if you want to learn about that. But then after that, they they actually made, the transistor was invented, so they made electronic machines after that. So this is the time when they were getting, the machines were getting more complicated and more general purpose. So you could actually program them to do whatever you wanted on them virtually. So when they got these general purpose mach machines now, they were kind of programming them and each machine had its own operating system on at the time. So every new machine make and model had a different operating system. Unlike today where we have probably everyone's got Windows or Mac or Linux or something like that. So the operating system is a piece of software on your machine which communicates with the hardware and other software. So if you imagine like a tear or a cake of something in fact, so you've got the hardware down here, this is where you've got the, the CPU, your GPU, and your RAM, etc., whatever. That's your hardware. And up here you've got your software, other software like um, or your apps. So this could be um, your web browser. Nowadays I'm just thinking. Um, it could be a text editor. It could be even, I don't know, music player. Just something to, to talk about. And then in between you've got your operating system or your OS, so operating system. Now what this operating system does is that it communicates between, lets the things communicate with each other so they can communicate back and forth and the operating system communicates back and forth with the hardware. So the operating system is kind of like a barrier between so the software can actually talk to the hardware because otherwise each piece of software would be made for each specific hardware. The operating system kind of abstracts this and makes it easier to develop applications. So at the time, they had each 
computer had a different operating system. Nowadays, we have what numerous different, uh, just general operating systems. So our operating systems today are like Windows, uh, Mac, OS X or 10, or what do you say, Linux, um, iOS, um, Android, uh, BSD. There's, oh, I mean, there's loads. And in the 70s, they would, this is where the, gen, the idea of having a general operating system was coming from, in a sense. They had ones before, but they weren't very successful, or they were proprietary, well, not just proprietary, but they were very close and they couldn't get at them and they were expensive. So what they were developing at the time in the 70s, which was Dennis Ritchie and Ken Thompson at Bell Labs, they were developing an operating system called Unix. And Unix was meant to be a general operating system which you could install on multiple different computers. So that means it doesn't matter what you make a model was, if if you could get Unix installed, it means you've got Unix on one computer over here and another computer over there with a different computer, but they had the same operating system. So when Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie were developing Unix, they needed a, like a portable language to, to develop it with. So when so they had a portable operating system, they needed a portable language as well. So Dennis Ritchie was developing C at the time. So I'll put C over here. So C didn't come out of nowhere. This was kind of um, and it, it kind of evolved from Ken Thompson's language B and BCPL and all those as well. So you can see why he called it C. It was after B. And as they were designing it, if they missed a feature in Unix, they could and they knew how to do it in C, they would add it. And if they hadn't had got the features in C, but they just implemented. So there was kind of this symbiotic relationship between Unix and C. And so they created this language to be a general purpose programming language that was portable and was de designed to develop a, an operating system. So that was the main purpose of C. And even to this day, it is one of the most, it is the most portable programming language to date. Most things, when you get a computer or design a new operating system, the first piece of software ever designed for it usually is the C compiler, or so they can actually create their C programs in C, compile, make them down so into a program, and they can run those programs. You can run or make all the other programs up as well. That's what they usually do. Now, Nowadays, most operating systems are derived from Unix, except Windows and Solaris, and I think, is that the right? I think I might be wrong, so I'm probably correct me in the comments. But Linux, Mac, Android, iOS, BSD, these are all derived from Unix all the, and such. So when I mean derived, they take the same philosophies or they actually are the same code. Um, Linux it hasn't got the same code. It, the reason why it's got similar names is because, look, it's similar but it's nothing like it, in fact. That's what they're trying to, why they called it that, in a sense. So that's what they were developing it for. So C, as I said, is a portable programming language. And it's just, it's not more, it's kind of more than a portable programming language, because it was kind of designed to be a portable assembly language. Now I'm going to write I explain what assembly language is now. Now at the time, um, if you want to program on a computer and you didn't have a language or such, you would have to write in the exact machine code that you needed. So I'm going to write machine code. I'm going to do these layer tier things again just to explain it. So you've got machine code down here. Now machine code is literally the raw information that the computer understands and it will read it and stuff. So it'll be literally ones and zeros and like that, just be some bits and bits and bytes and stuff, bits and bytes and bobs, dot, 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 whatever. And that's what the machine code is. And up here, you've got your C code. Now, what the C code did was abstract, the not just the machine code, but it was actually something in, in here called the assembly code. Now, assembly code is kind of a human readable version of this machine code. Because it, it kind of looked something like um, like this, in a sense. Add ECX to, I don't know, I'm just making this up, dot, 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 whatever. Yeah, what, dot, dot, dot. So what it was kind of, it was kind of human readable thing. So they had this operator here. So this was add, and this could be direct, directly translated into some machine code. So it could have been this piece of code here. I'm making this up, by the way. So it could have said, add is that. This bit things means this bit, and then that bit means that bit. So literally, you could turn these bits into machine code. So it was extremely human readable. 
but assembly code changes depending on what computer you're on and what architecture and all that lot and it's so that means it's not a portable thing and I wouldn't recommend anyone to write assembly code unless they really have to and they know exactly what um, platform they're developing for and such so if you're working on a console you know that all the platforms are going to be the same so you could write some assembly code for that but nowadays I wouldn't recommend many people to do assembly code and if you need to write it you'll definitely know you'll want to write it not think oh do I need to you probably don't <laughs> it's a short answer so what C code did was abstract this even further and said okay you know what this is we're gonna say X equals Y plus 3 or something like that and literally it abstracted it so this is much easier to read you've got some variables you've got numbers symbols and then this thing could be directly translated into this assembly code very easily and then assembly code can be turned in machine code so that is one of the reasons it's kind of a portable assembly language it doesn't matter what your assembly language looks on another computer because for all I know it, comes, it might instead of add it might say um, flop it might some, say something else it will literally be a different command or it may be in a different structure it lays out it may not just have these two things it may have three inputs it may have one input it, you can see what I kind of mean yeah there's different ways of laying it out so C was trying to abstract this so as you can see C was created to create operating systems but why do we use it still today do we only just make operating systems with it and the answer is no most applications today, if they need a lot of performance, they'll use something like C, something that low level. So there's C, there's C++, there's Fortran, there's, I know I'm talking, Fortran's very old, I do know people still use it, um, and there's many other low level languages. And so what many things that still people use today, so programs that, programs made with C, I say, and there are numerous programs that may see. So the first op one we know is the operating system. Um, another one is games, because games need a lot of performance, and C allows you to get that. And many games nowadays aren't made in C; they're made in C++, but only for cultural reasons, not for actual like limitations or anything. C allows you to do it. If you asked me ten years ago, most games were made in C. Then um, you can make other applications. So you can make web browsers. Um, you can make um, I don't know the thing that you're watching you can watch now say video players and um, it, the list goes on and on. If you can th think of a program, you can make you can most definitely make it in C. Um, you can even make a C compiler in C, and that's technically called bootstrapping. I won't go into detail. I'm going a bit off tangent. So that's what. So the reason why you'd want to program in C is if you wanted to be if to be fast have good performance performance I can't write oh no nope, I missed out on N <laughs> performance and he wanted it to be portable so you'd be able to portable on on different computers even if you did to an operating system you still have to change some of the code but most the majority of the code would still work yeah so that is what you'd program in C for. So in the next video, I'm going to talk about how you actually start like the process of making a, a game in a game or an application or anything in C. So there's a certain like process to make any program solve any problem. In fact, so we're stationed for that video. And thank you for watching.